the items on the table are not randomly picked scary items. Most of the items were mentioned in the Pfaffenberger Affidavit, which was written four months before Buchenwald was liberated. Take, for example, the shrunken heads. In December 1944, Andreas Pfaffenberger wrote, There I also saw the shrunken heads of two young Poles who had been hanged for having had relations with German girls. And on April 16th, there they are just in time to be filmed for Billy Wilder's propaganda movie. Psych warfare likely planted the heads and other objects in the camp after reading about them in the Pfaffenberger affidavit. They did it as part of their denazification program. As the head of psych warfare, Robert McClure wrote to his wife, The shooting war is over. With one phase over, I am now up to my neck on the control phase. The control phase was the Holocaust myth phase, the denazification phase. The Buchenwald table is just one small part of this phase. To understand what psych warfare did at Buchenwald, let's make an analogy to McDonald's. When I was 12 years old, there was a rumor that McDonald's hamburger meat had worms in it. It's probably because meat has a worm shape after it passes through a grinder. While it would be hard for someone to create a nationwide rumor like that, it would not be hard for someone to pick the back door lock of a McDonald's late at night and put some containers of worms in their freezer and then call the health department and a TV station the next day. Figuratively, that's what psych warfare did at Buchenwald. They supported existing rumors rather than create new ones. To give an idea why, let's read a passage from the book Psych War. Despite its importance, rumor as a technique is difficult to assess because it is difficult to control. Many rumors said to be based upon Psych War broadcasts, for example, bore little relation to either the content or the intention of the broadcasts from which they derived. An extended field trip over Allied-held areas of Western Germany in the month preceding surrender led one psych warfare intelligence investigator to observe that rumor-mongering sometimes had unpredictable consequences. Often enough, the news spread by this method bore only a casual resemblance to the news actually announced over Allied transmitters. So instead they decided to support existing rumors they learned about in the Pfaffenberger affidavit. But who was Andreas Pfaffenberger? He was a 43-year-old captured German soldier with a rare background. He had been an inmate at Buchenwald prior to being drafted into the German army. Pfaffenberger surrendered here five months before Buchenwald was liberated here. The distance is around 225 miles. Psych Warfare used his statement to start planning for Buchenwald before the camp was liberated. Besides mentioning two shrunken heads, the Pfaffenberger affidavit mentions human skin lampshades, and it mentions tattooed skin. But there's a problem for Psych Warfare's plan. They are planting objects based on old rumors. Because Pfaffenberger likely lied about how up-to-date his information was. He claimed he'd been at Buchenwald from November 1938 to June 1944. But while dropping as many names as he could, he never mentioned the name of the camp's current commander, Hermann Pister, and he'd been the commander from 1942 on, probably because Pfaffenberger had left the camp before 1942. Here's another indicator that Pfaffenberger's information was old. The camp had a position called Senior Prisoner, or Lagerl Test, and Pfaffenberger mentions Alfred Richter as holding that position, but Richter held the position in the late 1930s. Pfaffenberger doesn't mention the men who held the position after that, probably because he'd already left by then. By using old information that they think is current, the Buchenwald table hoax becomes logically flawed. 
because even if, say, atrocity items had been in the camp at one time, they wouldn't have been there after the Morgan investigation, or after Herman Pister took over, or after Ilse Koch left, or after Karl Koch's execution. Take Karl Koch. The SS were so interested in justice that they brought this former commander back to Buchenwald just so they could execute him in the camp where he committed his crimes. It's unlikely that on the day they executed him, the current commander, Hermann Pister, would have had human skin lampshades and shrunken heads made from inmates lying around. So where did psych warfare get the objects? probably from the same place this dissertation comes from, the University of Jena, just ten miles away. This brings up Kenneth Kipperman. As a Jewish pre-teen, the table items made a deep impact on him when he saw them on television in the 1950s. His work might be in your wallet right now, because as an employee with the United States Bureau of Printing and Engraving, he engraved the image of Alexander Hamilton on the $10 bill. When he's not doing that, he researches the Buchenwald table items, and in a Jerusalem Post article we read about Kipperman looking at a good quality photo of the table. And next to the lamp was a report of some kind. Using his engraver's magnifying glass, Kipperman made out the German printing on the cover, tracked down its origin, and had the report, a doctoral dissertation on the sociology of tattooing, translated. The dissertation, A Contribution to the Tattooing Question, was written by Dr. Eric Wagner of the Institute of Forensic Medicine and Scientific Criminology at Friedrich Schiller University in Jena, Germany. Wagner had done research at Buchenwald around the time Pfaffenberger was there, around 1939 or 1940. Psych warfare likely went to the university and picked up the dissertation, the tattoos, the medical oddities, and even grabbed a death mask found at the front left of the table. Plaster death masks were used to make an impression of a person's face and were popular in the days before photography. They are found in many cultures. The death mask makes sense as a piece pilfered from a university collection, but doesn't really make sense as an atrocity item.